Welcome to Periop Talk. My name is Renee Battier, Vice President of Nursing at AORN, and I'm here today with another Renee, Dr. Renee Wright, Senior Perioperative Practice Specialist at AORN. We're going to spend some time talking about the newly updated guideline on patient temperature management. Let's dive right in. Well, Renee, this is not a new guideline for AORN, but it is updated and it has a new name. So tell us a bit about the review process and how we got there, because I think it's a great change and there's some hard work behind it. Yes. So as Maybe some people may not be aware of the guidelines are on a scheduled review cycle, and that occurs about every five years. Um, And then we have once, you know, we get the title that we're going to work on, the lead author of the guideline collaborates with our guideline development team um, composed of members of the ARN Guidelines Advisory Board. And we call those that group affectionately the GAB Um, and the GAB is comprised of AORN perioperative nurse members. Um, We have a patient advocate on there, and we have a bunch of GAB liaisons, all of who represent um, various organizations. Um, We have the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology, the American College of Surgeons, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, the Healthcare Sterile Processing Association, and I think the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. I think that's just about everybody in that group. It really represents kind of our surgical team and partners in uh, in really trying to bring the best case forward for how we deliver care in our in our environment. And I think it's a great representation of that. So tell us about some of the significant changes as you went through the evidence and started to look at what needs to be updated, what's different, what's stronger, et cetera. So probably the most, um, the change that was most visible is the change to the guideline name itself, right? We started off with the guideline for prevention of hypothermia and it became the guideline for patient temperature management because we expanded the guideline scope to now include malignant hyperthermia. And so that's kind of been added back to the guideline, so to speak. Um, We have a new section to support facilities and teams in developing a patient temperature management plan for how they're going to really tackle that issue of perioperative normothermia. Um, That includes Let's see, prevention of hypothermia and malignant hyperthermia, as well as quality, which is really important um, so that you can see if what you're doing is going to have that intended effect or if something needs to change. Um, The recommendations in this section kind of really sketch out what the plan should include, what lists, um, it has lists of suggested components, and then we have some policy and procedure topics. Um, We also created a sample perioperative normothermia bundle, so you don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel um, and start from scratch, right, if your facility happens to not have that sort of document in place already. Um, We revised some of the recommendation language around active warming and pre-warming and passive insulation, just really to reinforce that active warming is at the top. It's going to be the most effective um, and more effective than passive insulation, really, Uh, for raising patient temperature and treating and preventing hypothermia. Um, We found that passive insulation alone is not effective in preventing inadvertent hypothermia, and especially for patients undergoing general anesthesia. Um, And then we have two new recommendations. The first one to implement intraoperative warming according to your patient temperature management plan, um, and then to continue warming, right? into the post-operative period while minimizing interruptions to warming because we saw in the literature that, you know, these inconsistent warming practices and then the lengthy pauses in warming can really contribute to hypothermia. How much of that was related to the changes in evidence versus just really trying to bring this and consolidate it to the planning and the consistency of that care? Um, I'd say it was more definitely making everything consistent practice. Uh, what I saw in the literature, it's 
wasn't necessarily new and earth shattering new conclusions or new knowledge that we weren't aware of. It's really just kind of reaffirming what we've already known for lots and lots of time. Right. I love this. That's why I asked about it, because I think it really represents how the importance of the evidence is not just that we know the evidence, but in how it's applied. And sometimes just the formatting and the the how it is um, shared and uh, with our audience is a way of enabling them to more consistently provide that care and find the information around it. I think you all did a great job with this. Tell me about um, the recommendations for identifying and monitoring hypothermia. Where, how, what kind of changes were in that part of this document? Yes. Well, we have added a peri- uh, pre-op assessment back to the guideline um, to really help nurses kind of identify patients at risk for hypothermia. And unfortunately, the evidence in this area because was really kind of inconsistent. Um, researchers in one study might have identified a risk factor for hypothermia. And then in another study, um, they found that that factor that was identified in study number one did not increase risk. So that was challenging um, to kind of bring together for, you know, everyone to see in the rationale. Um, Age was another tricky thing because the research didn't really agree on like a specific age as a risk factor. Um, So we kind of had to adopt some less precise language. You'll see older and younger rather than specific ages um, to describe age. And some of the other risks we had to talk about kind of in a similar way um, that were identified in the literature. Um, Another limitation that we saw in the evidence is that there was a lack of research-validated, user-friendly hypothermia risk assessment tools um, that could help our clinicians, you know, quantify the patient's level of risk for hypothermia. Um, The tools that have been studied have only kind of been applied in very specific patient populations, and they're not really widely used just yet. So I'm hoping that that changes by the next guideline review and we have some more things to work with. Sounds like great opportunities for our perioperative nurse researchers. We know a couple of them. So opportunity for us to be more specific in uh, how we identify who to do the most with. What about um, any changes with temperature monitoring? Um, Other than kind of rewording in wordsmithing for clarity, recommendations for temperature monitoring did not change significantly. Um, we mostly kind of updated the rationales really to reflect newer and in some areas stronger evidence, but it didn't really necessitate any changes in practice. Um, what about some of the temperature management devices? Since there's there's lots out there and it can be confusing to just decide on that, I know. Yes, that's what I was going to get to. <laughs> Too. We think alike, right? Mm, so we did add a recommendation um, to do pre-purchase evaluation of all temperature measurement devices, and it covers devices used for active warming and passive insulation as well in that recommendation statement. Um, but it's the rationale where we really kind of synthesize the evidence um, mm. found on the accuracy of non-invasive peripheral and core devices used to measure temperature, so like thermometers. Um, And what might be particularly interesting um, is discussion on the kind of newer-ish devices that can be applied in pre-op, usually to the forehead, um, and then they kind of follow the patient all the way through their perioperative journey, allowing for consistent comparisons between um, pre-, intra-, and post-operative temperatures, which is really essential when you're going to be monitoring patients for hypothermia. You really want those truly kind of apples-to-apples ratings. Absolutely. And it creates issues and um, heated conversations sometimes in um, surgical teams, I know, having been there on were we effective or were we not effective because the devices changed. So I think that's definitely a hot topic uh, for us going forward. So speaking of that, talk a little bit about the implementation. What What's the ways and the takeaways for teams to really move on how to be effectively implementing these guidelines? Yes. Well, it all starts with interdisciplinary collaboration to really set that foundation for your patient temperature management um, plan. 
because your interdisciplinary team is going to need to come together to develop that plan um, that standardizes your practices. They're going to want to establish those policies and procedures. They're going to need to design that normothermia bundle and then continually kind of monitor the progress and track those patient outcomes um, to see that what you're doing is having the right kind of impact. And then the other things that go along with implementation, of course, uh, staff education, your competency verification, monitoring adherence, which I touched on, and then making sure that thermometers and your warming devices are all accessible and being maintained properly, right, and used properly. I love that it starts with the name change, normal thermia, because it's that's what we want to maintain. And uh, just that subtle name change, I think, helps us with, no, don't wait until it's already hypothermia. You want to maintain that normal thermia and why. So why is it such an issue? What gets in the way of folks really implementing these bundles well? Um, it kind of like the system, the very high up level, right? I would say that cost is certainly an issue. Resource allocation, right? Getting the right things in the right places. And then staff adherence um, can also be a challenge. Your equipment, your supplies, your resources, they all come at a cost, right? Um, but when you're looking at that, you also want to weigh what's the cost of not preventing hypothermia or not maintaining normal thermia, right? Right. Um, because those poor outcomes, hypothermia, all its associated complications, your increased SSI risk, cardiac complications, increased bleeding, pain, longer hospital stays, they're not really worth it. And ultimately, they're more costly to deal with in the long run, right? Right. And I think sometimes misunderstood that really, if you just go back to a normal thermia uh, engagement and bundle, a lot of these could be avoided or at least decreased. What about um, some misconceptions? Because there certainly is a team element um, is it for every site? Is it for ambulatory? Is it related to surgery? What are some of those misconceptions that we've tried to clarify better in this guide? Um, I think that what it comes down to is it's so basic. Like we think that you, these are not earth shattering or terribly difficult um, things to implement patient warming, but it's something that we forget about. We think, oh, our case is super short. You know, our patient's not going to get cold. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, the research studying the mechanisms of hypothermia show that with general in, or induction of general anesthesia, um, your temperature drops significantly in that first hour after induction, right? And then it kind of levels off or kind of tapers off. Um, and you get about as cold as you're going to get. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that happens in the first hour. So short cases are going to be still affected by this. Um, and it's important that teams have in place things to kind of mitigate that initial drop, even for the short cases, because those are the cases that are going to be super simple and you don't want any complications or anything untoward to happen to the patient, right? And it's another element of standardizing care for patients, regardless of if it's going to be short, and then there's a delay, or the surgeon got caught in another room, all of those things that then they come up, and the things that you that you don't know until it's already happening. So that consistency and standardization just comes through again. So the most important outcomes, you've gone through a lot of outcomes for the patient that are really impacted. Would would you point to a couple of them that are probably most important? That's a good question. Um, I'd say that obviously, you know, we're all use uh, surgical site infections as a mm -hmm. big metric. Um, and the other one that was could have significant implications um, for the patient are any cardiac complications and bleeding, right? Absolutely. Um, those sorts of things, as well as then when you're looking at the big picture of their hospital stay, right? you want to see how long did they need to stay in recovery or how long did they have to stay in the hospital altogether? Because that's kind of where you're going to get into um, the bottom line in terms of, you know, when we're looking at costs and savings. Oh, right. 
we want to efficiencies. Quite honestly, yeah. if somebody has to be at normal thermia to get out of the PACU, then we don't need to delay that anymore by having allowed them to get cold for any reason. And having to spend time trying to warm exactly. them up before we send them on their way, right? Exactly. Exactly. All of those things come through. So this is really helping us have recommendations for practice and how to. I think that's a super important part of this is it's really about the how to and the engagement. So tell a little bit about the other ways people have the tools needed to uh, take this and really be able to run with it. Yes. So we have um, the guideline essentials, and that's mm-hmm. where our members are going to find all those extra tools and resources to support implementation of the guideline. Um, we have educational presentation slides to help you formulate those presentations that can help you uh, dispel all those misconceptions, right, with, um, with staff, um, clinical FAQs, case studies, videos. And you'll also see a lot of the tools that used to live in the hypothermia prevention toolkit, which has kind of gone on its way. It's morphed into the guideline tool. Morphed into these tools that are really connected to the guideline itself. Yes, they've migrated. Have you gotten feedback from teams or peri-op nurses about this so far? I haven't heard anything just yet. Um, We heard some kind of rumblings when we were doing the guideline workshops mm-hmm. last fall um, mm-hmm. because we kind of gave them a preview of what the guideline was going to look like, but it hadn't uh, been published just yet. So right. Right. still waiting to hear more things, but I haven't heard anything right. bad. Yeah, for all these tools will really help in the implementation because that's where it just gets hung up. These are not new practices, but the consistency is where we trip up. And if we really believe all patients deserve the best care possible, these are the tools that will help us. And it's going back. Great comments. Great comments. Dr. Wright, thank you for taking the time today to really help us understand some of the why for this update and really how it can impact our own patient temperature management and our patient care. To our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We hope this has been helpful, both about this updated guideline and how it can really impact you and your care for your patients. You can find it now in your EG Plus accounts, as well as your 2025 print guideline book and ebook. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon on Periop Talk.